Hi, in this second part of my presentation, I'll be focusing on the clinical rationale and application of the ICD-11 classification of personality disorders. If you haven't seen the introductory part one, I recommend that you watch it first. So why does it matter to focus on severity of personality disorder? Research suggests that much of the predictive and prognostic value of personality disorder assessment can be derived from a global dimension of personality dysfunction. In this way, the ICD-11 classification may serve as a steering tool for clinical management. For example, where mild personality disorder may be treated by a psychologist or a psychiatrist in primary care, severe personality disorder may be treated in a more specialized setting. One particular rationale of focusing on severity is that the more severe personality disorder, the greater the risk there is for extreme or problematic behavior. For example, level of risk may involve risk of harm to self in terms of cutting, harm to others in terms of violence, or risk of experiencing psychotic-like symptoms. In terms of prognosis, the more severe personality disorder, the less optimistic the clinician can be for smooth treatment with rapid and enduring gains. And this may also involve risk of treatment dropout. In terms of intensity of clinical management, individuals with severe personality disorder may need more intense treatment, such as hospitalization or community psychiatry. And finally, the severity dimension ranging from no personality disorder to severe personality disorder may be used as an outcome measure, which may be useful or beneficial for evaluation of all personality disordered individuals, if not patients in general. And now I'll go through some examples of what to consider in clinical evaluation of personality disorder severity in terms of impaired capacities in personality functioning. Mild personality disorder may be associated with substantial distress or with impairment in personal, family, social, educational, occupational or other important areas of functioning that is either limited to circumscribed areas, for example, romantic relationships or employment, or present in more areas but in milder degrees. And moderate personality disorder is associated with marked impairment in personal, family, social, educational, occupational or other important areas of functioning, although functioning in circumscribed areas may be maintained. And severe personality disorder is associated with severe impairment in all or nearly all areas of life, including personal, family, social, educational, occupational and other important areas of functioning. In terms of stability and coherence of one's sense of identity, mild personality disorder may involve that the individual has a somewhat contradictory sense of self. For example, the extent to which identity or self or sense of self is variable and inconsistent or overly rigid and fixed. In contrast, severe personality disorder often involves an unrealistic or highly unstable sense of self. Or self view. In terms of the, capa the capacity for self direction, mild personality disorder may involve a compromised ability to set appropriate goals, for example, the ability to plan, choose, and implement appropriate goals. In contrast, severe personality disorder may often involve inability to set and pursue realistic goals. In terms of the accuracy of situational and interpersonal appraisals under stress, the mild personality disorder may involve some distortions as often seen in emotional disorders. In contrast, severe personality disorder may be characterized by extreme distortion corresponding to psychotic-like perceptions. 
Apart from reality testing, this capacity may also be related to the capacity for mentalization or social cognition. In terms of interpersonal relationships, mild personality disorder may involve several problems in many relationships, but certain relationships are maintained and social roles are carried out. In contrast, severe personality disorder may involve interpersonal problems that seriously affect all relationships. In terms of cooperation and employment, mild personality disorder may involve some conflicts with colleagues, but is generally able to sustain employment. In contrast, severe personality disorder may involve that the individual is either unwilling or unable to, to work to keep a regular job or to work in general. In terms of the ability to understand others' perspective, mild personality disorder may cause difficulties in developing close relationships. In contrast, severe personality disorder may involve shallow or extremely one-sided attitudes towards others, including violence if it feels necessary. In terms of harm to self or others, mild personality disorder is typically not associated with substantial harm, whereas severe personality disorder is often associated with harm. And the level of complexity may also help the clinician indicate levels of personality dysfunction. Accordingly, in mild personality disorder, the disturbance affects some areas which may apply to what we know as avoidant personality disorder, whereas severe personality disorder affects multiple areas of life, which may apply to what we know as borderline personality disorder due to, the, due to its complexity and overlap with other personality disorders. And now I will highlight why it may prove to be informative to specify the trait qualifiers. For example, it makes a great difference whether impaired personality functioning is related to being very dominant, for example, as, a, as an aspect of the trait domain of dissociality, or being overly submissiveness as an aspect of negative affectivity and detachment. And those two different trait expressions inform different treatment foci and modality. So knowing the patient's prominent traits is useful for establishing a favorable treatment alliance and providing psychoeducation, increasing the patient's self-knowledge and planning realistic treatment goals and matching therapy to the patient's personality in general. For example, should it be group therapy or individual therapy, or maybe a combination. When working with negative affectivity, the clinician may focus on emotion regulation and mobilizing affect tolerance or accept. And when working with dissociality, the clinician may focus on hostile behavior as overcompensation and or a risk factor. And the clinician may also uh, work with mobilizing less harmful behavior. The borderline pattern qualifier has been included to enhance the clinical utility of the classification of personality disorders. There is considerable overlap between this pattern and information contained in the trait domain qualifiers. However, use of this qualifier may facilitate the identification of individuals who may respond to certain psychotherapeutic treatments. As shown here, the borderline pattern features overall aligns align with the DSM-5 personality disorder criteria, including the pseudo-psychotic features in criterion 9, which involve transient dissociative symptoms or psychotic-like features for example, brief hallucinations or paranoia in situations of high affective arousal.
The ICD-11 borderline pattern qualifier also offers other possible manifestations, not all of which may be present in a given individual at a given time. They could include features, features such as a view of self as being bad or a sense of alienation and loneliness and rejection sensitivity or mistrust in relationships and misinterpretation of social signals. In order to illustrate how trait domain qualifiers contribute to the unique expression of personality disturbance, we may think of two different patients, patient 1 and patient 2, who are both diagnosed with a moderate personality disorder. And both patients have moderate impairment of interpersonal functioning indicating that they have relationship problems. Patient 1 shows interpersonal problems in terms of being controlled and strongly dominant in relationships, which is captured by the trait domains of dissociality and anacastia. In contrast, patient 2 shows interpersonal problems in terms of being highly submissive or overcompliant and avoidant in relationships, which is captured by the trait domains of negative affectivity and detachment. In order to facilitate the continuity with familiar clinical practice, practitioners may employ a crosswalk between ICD-10 categorical diagnosis and the ICD-11 trait domain qualifiers. For example, the ICD-10 diagnosis of anxious avoidant personality disorder may be described in terms of negative affectivity and detachment. In this case, the negative affectivity specifically captures features of fear, shame, low self-esteem and avoidance of certain situations. And detachment specifically captures avoidance of social interactions and intimacy. Likewise, the ICD-10 diagnosis of emotionally unstable personality disorder, also referred to as borderline personality disorder, may be described in terms of negative affectivity, disinhibition and some dissociality. In this case, negative affectivity specifically captures features of poor emotion regulation and disinhibition specifically captures features of self-destructive impulsivity and lack of planning, whereas dissociality captures a tendency to be mean and aggressive. The operationalization of ICD-11 personality disorder classifica classification or severity may be evaluated using different approaches. For example, the clinician may use the SCID AMPD Module 1 interview for levels of personality, personality functioning or a self-report screening measure such as the Level of Personality Functioning Scale Brief Form version 2.0 or the SASPD. It is expected that a clinical interview for ICD-11 personality disorders will be developed sometime in the future. And this slide illustrates the correspondence between DSM-5 Section 3 levels of functioning and the ICD-11 levels of severity. In this study, we sought to find out whether clinicians may take advantage of the established DSM-5 traits to describe the ICD-11 trait domain qualifiers. The article provides an algorithm for calculating ICD-11 trait domain qualifiers based on the DSM-5 trait facets. And next, in this study, we sought to find out whether ICD-11 and DSM-5 domains capture categorical personality disorders, as we know them from ICD-10 and the DSM-4 or DSM-5 Section 3. And the study suggests that a crosswalk may be employed to describe ICD-11 personality disorder trait domains using categorical personality disorder diagnosis. So taken together, 
the operation, operationalization of ICD-11 trait domain qualifiers may be evaluated using different approaches, including the SCID AMPD Module 2 interview and the personality inventory for the DSM-5, also uh, abbreviated PIT-5, and the personality inventory for ICD-11, referred to as PICD. And this slide shows the correspondence between the DSM-5 trait domains and the ICD-11 trait domains. Finally, in this survey conducted among Danish mental health practitioners, we found that psychologists, medical doctors and other mental health care professionals generally judge the ICD-11 classification of personality disorders as slightly more useful than the ICD-10 classification. And this particularly applied to the utility for treatment formulation. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this video helped you understand some of the clinical rationale and application of the ICD-11 classification of personality disorders. If you are also interested in the potential overlap between personality disorders and the ICD-11 classification of complex PTSD, I recommend that you watch the video about complex PTSD in ICD-11 by Professor Andreas Merker.